so we, first Saturday of the month, we, we process the Torah, we grab a Pasha, just so you know, and you know this, but some don't know this, the kings were told to take a copy of the scroll of the Torah, okay, in Deuteronomy. They had to carry a copy with them all the time. It had to be with them on their throne, it had to be with them wherever they went, because they had to read the Torah because the king was not above the law. He was the number one guy, but he was not above the law. And if he walked with God, then chances are the people of Israel would walk with God, and everything would be copacetic. So he had to keep a copy. It's right in the Torah, and he had to read it. Well, when it said read it in a year, he figured the people should read it in a year too. So all they did was break it down in 50 pieces for the 50 weeks of the year so it'd be read in a year. It, it makes sense, right? It's logical. If God told me I needed to read it, I would break it up evenly. And so every week there's a portion a piece of the Torah that we're supposed to read according to the Bible. And so this week, this is the portion, and we read a portion of a portion, because sometimes it's 100 verses, 150 verses, 95 verses. It's a little much. I, if you know me, forget it. You'd be here till Yeshua comes back. So, so we, have a little, we have a little portion. But I, it's, 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 you know how I feel about context. It's very dangerous to read Scripture out of context. It, it's so dangerous. It is, it is the faux pas. It is the mistake of all mistakes we make when in trying to understand God's word. It is the number one mistake, taking a verse from a letter and then trying to decipher what it means. I mean, picture, some of you are married, right? Let's say I found a letter that your husband wrote to you. When did he write it? Was he in the army? Were you guys split apart? Was something going on with your kids? Was it a health issue? What was, where did he write it from? Where was he? Where did you receive it? What was going on at the time of your relationship? What does the whole letter say? You think I'm going to find a letter, take one line, and think I know what's going on? And do we not do this all the time? We do this all the time, and we know that, we know that hermeneutics, the way to interpret Scripture, that is the number one mistake. Why do we keep making it? I, I, you know, I sound frustrated because I'm like, Who's teaching people how to read Scripture? If nobody teaches you how to read it, how are you going to understand it for yourself? Once a week to get a little sermonette on how to apply something to your life to make you a better person is not interpreting Scripture. It's a motivational speaking. We have enough of that, don't we? Anyway. So forgive me, it's going to take a little bit to put this together, a little bit, and forgive me. But you know what? Maybe for some of you, this is the first time you've even looked at the Bible this week. Maybe. And I'm not knocking it. You might have been busy. You might have had a crazy week. So in, try to enjoy it. Maybe you'll get something out of it, and that will be good for you. It will be good for God. It will be good for everybody. So we've got to start in Genesis 27. <laughs> he just read from Genesis 35. I'm not going to do eight chapters. No, listen. In Genesis 27, we find basically the trickery of Rebecca to deceive Isaac, her husband, okay? It really was her kind of mastermind. I know Jacob gets a lot of bad play. Um, I'm not one who likes to assassinate or disrespect people in the Bible. I think it's very easy to play Monday morning quarterback. It's too easy. I'm sure if Jacob was here right now and he put my life under a microscope, he could probably assassinate my character if he wanted to. So I'm, I'm just not going to go there. I know sometimes in the believing community we nail these people, like we nail David, we nail Jacob. I think we should nail ourselves a little bit. Um, in Genesis 27, so Rebecca is, is basically deceiving her husband Isaac because she wants who to get the birthright. Now I know people say, oh, I have no favorites with my kids, baloney. It's a lie. <laughs> there's some kids that are favorites to you for different reasons I like this kid because he's easy going I like her because she's always willing to you know different things anyway Rebecca obviously had a close relationship with, with Jacob not that she didn't love Esau but Esau was like a kind of a man's man Jacob was more you know he, I don't want to say a mom's boy <laughs> I don't want to say that because that's not he was close to his mother I mean there's nothing wrong with a son loving his mother right some of you have a son that loves you dearly, and he's not, you know, a hunter. You know, he's not a fighter. Well, who says he has to be? He's tender, right? We, we need more tender men. There's not enough out there, right? Guys are too tough. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So he's tender, and she wants him to get the birthright. But this is the thing. 
Why was she plotting it in the first place? Because God already promised it. So obviously she didn't believe it. And maybe we could fall into that same category about certain things. For 20 years, Rebecca remained barren. But let's look at Genesis 25 for a minute, just three verses. 21 to 23, it says, Yitzchak, Isaac, prayed to Adonai on behalf of his wife. She's barren. We know that in the days of the Torah, in the days of antiquity, if you were barren, it was a curse. How do we know? Because Leviticus 26 tells us in Deuteronomy 28. And in a way, it's still kind of like not a good thing. That's why people will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in fertility. And I'm not knocking that. Just understand, people don't want to have to do that because they want to be able to procreate, have children. And when you can't, it's not like you're cursed individually, but it's not a good thing. It's not a blessing, right? When you say, hey, we're dying to have children, we can't, I, I feel a blessing. You understand? It's not that you're cursed individually, but it's a curse. It's not a good thing. And so he's praying to God because for 20 years she's barren. I don't know, he heeded his prayer. And you could imagine, plus Isaac is the son of promise. He knows that his father received this covenant with God that they're going to have this multitude of people in this land. And he's up to bat and he can't get his wife pregnant. How is that going to be fulfilled? You could see him panicking and he's old. You understand what's going on? Rabbi, why do you make us feel the scriptures? Because you'll never understand them if you don't feel them. I have, I've never believed in memorization of scripture. All the churches I've ever went, they go, this is our memory verse. Yeah, so you memorize, regurgitate, and forget. What's the good of memorize something if you don't know what's going on? You've got to feel this. This guy is up to bat. His wife's got to get pregnant or the promise can't be fulfilled. God's reputation is on the line. So the Lord heeds his prayer. He, 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 he listens to his prayer, and he's going to deliver him. And, and Rivka, Rebecca, becomes pregnant. The children fought with each other in her womb so much that she said, if it's going to be like this, why go on living? Can you imagine two kids like duking it out inside your womb on a daily basis? So they were at odds from the very beginning. So she went to inquire of the Lord. Like, what's going on here? What, what is going on in my womb? Lord, there are two nations in your womb, and we know that. The Edomites and the Israelites. They're at war to this day, okay? The Islamic people and the Jewish people are distant cousins. If you do DNA, 82% of them have Jewish blood. They hate their own blood. It's still today. It's crazy. From birth, they will be two rival peoples. This is what the Lord is telling them. They were. One of these peoples will be stronger than the other. Meaning Esau, one of whose Esau is going to be very strong. It's going to be tough. And the older will sput. The older will serve the younger. Now, when you see that, you know, Jacob grabbed on, and they say, oh, he was just a heel holder. You'll hear it in the church all the time. He was just a little scoundrel heel holder. Maybe he was pushing his foot away because he was getting kicked in the head. <laughs> you ever think that's a possibility? I mean, what kind of scoundrel could be, like, one minute old? <laughs> it's kind of crazy thinking, but this is what you're taught, and you've been taught it so long that you just what? Well, it's got to be the truth because they've been saying it so long. You might want to look into some of these truths for yourself. You, you just, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic or difficult, but I'm telling you, there is no way on God's green earth that somebody's going to tell me a truth and I'm not going to authenticate it. No way. You tell me all the time, well, 85%? I'm like, where do you get that from? You're like, oh, 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 oh. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I just said it. 85% sounds good. Jacob was honoring his mother. Jacob was honoring his mother when his mother said, you know, let's put the camel hair on you and, and get some of Esau's clothes and you smell like Esau because your father is dying and his eyesight is gone. He won't know. Jacob was honoring his mother, but you never honor your parents at the expense of dishonoring your God. I tell my kids that. If I tell you to do something that's not right, take the punishment from me. Even take my anger, but don't dishonor God. Although Rebecca planned the deception, Jacob was equally guilty, right? I tell my kids about being an accomplice. Oh, I was just driving with the guy. Dad, I don't know he was going to rob the bank. Once he gets in the car, you rob the bank with him. Whether you like it or not, that's the law. 
So it's not like Jacob was just going, Mom, I didn't. He could have said, Mom, you, you could punish me. You could disrespect, you know, but uh, call it what you want, but I, I'm not going to do it. He could have, right? He could have, but he didn't. But the other members of his family was at fault. Everybody heard from God that the younger was going to be served by the older. So Esau was at fault. Isaac was at fault. Rebecca was at fault. Jacob was at fault. See, we play the blame game. It was this one's fault. It was that one's fault. We do it today. We very rarely say it's my fault. Right? Same thing. Nothing's changed. Why? Because human nature is human nature. Nothing's new under the sun. By the way, how old do you think Jacob is? If you do this study, how old would you say? Just take a guess. What do you think? Come on. He sounds like he's like 16, right? 77. You would think at 77 he would know better. What does that tell you? Some of you 70-year-olds are still getting it wrong. <laughs> so Jacob makes his flight to Haran. He goes to Haran because his mother says, look, you need to hook up with my brother, Laban, your uncle, and find somebody within the family because there's old heathens here, Right? Find somebody within the family line. Okay, plus he's taking a flight to Haran because Esau is going to kill him. Right? Probably wasn't so crazy about him to begin with. They were fighting in the womb. What do you think at this stage? He's like, you know what? I never liked you. Now, now I got reason to take you out. And he vowed to kill him. He said, I'm going to kill you. I don't know when, but I'm, I'm going to kill you. You're dead. So he, he flees. And he's en route from Beersheba to Haran. Beersheba is in south of Israel. Haran is in Mesopotamia where Iraq is. And Jacob rests for a night. And he has an amazing dream, right? And let's look, just one verse, Genesis 28, 12. He dreamt there, before him was a ladder resting on the ground with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of the Lord, the angel of Adonai, were going up and down. Now, this is phenomenal. The message in here that God is telling Jacob is crazy. It's a message that's crazy for us, too. And it's a, it's a no-brainer, okay? Let's look at the word ladder. Ladder in Hebrew is ladder. But there's a root word. So let's look at the root word, salal. You're like, okay, I don't get it. Okay. But is to cast up a highway. And a highway, if you know what a highway is, it's a main road connecting major cities. Okay? That's what a highway is. A main road connecting major cities. So God, I think, is intimating to Jacob, who, by the way, has not had a real encounter with God on his own. Okay? You know God has no grandchildren, right? His father knew the Lord because he had an encounter with him, a very special encounter where he confirmed the covenant. Obviously, Abraham had an incredible encounter with the Lord too. Jacob hasn't had one yet. And we think about our kids. Well, they go, they keep coming every Saturday or every Sunday. When are they going to get it? When they have an encounter. Some of you didn't get it for a very long time. Some of you encountered the Lord here. This is where you knew of God, but you didn't know God. You knew of God, but you didn't really intimately know him. What God is saying with this ladder, guys, he's intimating the fact that we, we, people, regular people, human beings, can have a real, uninterrupted, close communion between heaven and earth. Somehow, some way, the God of the universe, who's beyond the heavenlies, can communicate with little old feeble human beings here on earth. I, I believe that's what he's saying. He's connecting cities the city of heaven or the city, the holy city of Jerusalem in the heavenlies with Jerusalem here on earth. Bridging, bridging. God is bridging, bridging this gap, if you will. Now, let's look when God confirms the covenant, just a couple more verses in Genesis 28. We'll continue on in 13 through 15. It says, then suddenly Adonai was standing there next to him. So we have a theophany. When people say, I, I don't understand how Yeshua can show up in the form of God. God showed up many times. And you, what, are you, what are you telling me? You're telling me the Torah is wrong? So now throw out the whole Torah. Now what do we got? We got nothing. We got no Judaism. We got no Christianity. We got nothing. Let's turn to some Eastern philosophy. Like a lot of people do. Because there's inconsistencies with their thought process. Okay? God is standing right next to him. He says, I am Adonai, the God of Abraham, your grandfather. He knew me. The God of Isaac, your father, he knew me. The land on which you are lying, I will give to you and to your descendants. 
Once again, guys, this is confirmed eight million times. You'd have to be, a, you'd have to be really an illogical buffoon to think that Israel doesn't belong to Israel. It's just silly at this point. I, I don't want to go into that. I've done a million teachings on that. You can get them. Okay? The land on which you are lying, I will give to you and your descendants. Who are his descendants? The children of Israel, obviously, because his name is Israel, so his children would be the, like, they're the children of Greg. Your descendants will be as numerous as the grains of dust on the earth. Now he's thinking, wow, that's crazy. That's just crazy. I'm not necessarily sure I'm believing that. I know he wasn't believing that. I know he wasn't believing that. He knew the story about how hard it was for his mom to get pregnant. He knew the story about his grandfather getting his wife pregnant at 100 years old. He's thinking, yeah, okay, whatever. Whatever. You will expand to the west and to the east. He's talking now man. And to the north and to the south. By you and your descendants, by me, like, you know, when they said to Gideon, oh, great and mighty man of God. You know, he pulled the taxi driver. You talking to me? <laughs> so, of course he's thinking this. He doesn't have a connection. Just go be him for a minute. He's not met the Lord. He's not met him. He says, by you, by you, by me, you, by you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Hey, he'd be happy to just know that he's going to have a couple of kids and he's going to have a blessed family. You're going to, you... Me, I'm going to bless the world. I'm going to bless the League of Nations. I'm going to bless the world. At this point, there was maybe 70 languages, 70 nations. Now we have about 211, 212, depending on who's counting. I'm going to bless, I'm going to bless the world? Okay, okay. And then he says, and this is just priceless. I just needed to highlight this. Look, I am with you. Listen to how personal God, people say, well, God was a God of wrath in the Old Testament. You're an imbecile. He wasn't a God of wrath. God didn't change. He didn't have a change in Matthew. He's like, I think I'll change my character. The Lord says he never changes. Hebrews says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He's the same. The book of Exodus is a beautiful, heartfelt story of God's incredible grace and mercy and love. From the very beginning of time, God had a plan to save the world. He always was loving. He didn't get loving in Matthew. And if you check Revelation, the blood is up to the horse's bridle. That doesn't sound too loving. Don't make God in your image or in the image that you were taught in your denomination. Read the Bible and figure out who he is. Know him. Perceive him. Taste and see. I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go. Look how personal, how beautiful God is in the Torah, Genesis. I will bring you back. Into, you're going to Haran to get a wife, but I'm bringing you back here. <laughs> yeah, but how am I going to get back here? Because I'm going to bring you back. How am I going to protect myself? You aren't. I'm going to protect you. But I'm all alone. No, I'm with you. If this is for Jacob, then this is for us. If you're grafted in, it's for you. If you're denominationalized, who knows? Because I won't leave you until I have done what I promised. He's telling Jacob, I'm going to be friends with you. You're going to have companionship with the God of the universe. You're going to be safe. I'm going to guide you, and I personally guarantee it. That's pretty rich. To me, it is anyway. Okay, next verse, 28, 16. Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, truly, I don't know he's in this place, and I didn't know it. He gets it. The light bulb goes off. Elizabeth Browning once said, the earth is crammed with heaven, every common bush of fire with God, but only he who sees it takes off his shoes. I look for burning bushes all the time. All the time. I'm looking for God. Where are you? 28.17, the next verse. Then he became afraid and said, good, this place is fearsome. Now, I like the way the complete Jewish Bible says fearsome and not awesome. Why? You know why, if you know me. If that word isn't thrown around, if I don't go to jail for knocking somebody out for using that word when they shouldn't use it, then it'll be a miracle. Rabbi, you seem very crazy. Because awesome 
is the word that's supposed to be used for God and only God. It says in Psalm 111, his name is holy and awesome. Now, you've been around a while. Have you heard the word awesome recently? For what? Everything. If you check, if you check an urban dictionary, that word came into our conversation in about 1967. Interesting to me, because a light switch went off in 67 when Jerusalem was back in the hands of the Jews. Then God had passed the baton. He's not done with the Gentiles, but he's kind of done. He's kind of done in the sense that it's going now to the Jews. It's been for 1,900 years proclaimed. The gospel has been proclaimed to the nations. Now it's going back to the Jews. They're going to learn that their Messiah is the king of the Jews. Yeshua is the king of the Jews, and they're going to learn that it does not take anything away from their Judaism. It doesn't change. In fact, it makes them more Jewish. I love my family. I love my family, and they love me. But they will never show me anywhere in the Torah where I'm not Jewish anymore because they believe in the Messiah. I'm more Jewish than I ever was. They're less Jewish than they ever was. They still think if they eat ham outside the house, it's kosher. Because it's not in the house. It's almost as crazy as, well, I didn't commit adultery in my house. It's crazy thinking. You follow? But the church is getting a revelation. Because the gospel that was always Jewish is being restored to its Jewish heritage. And they're learning that Jesus ain't the king of Wittenberg or Rome. He's the king of Israel. You know, at the beginning of the ministry, like for the first 10, 15 years, I hated it because I felt I was on a stretcher. Like in the medieval days, the Jews are pulling me and saying, hey, Greg, you're the biggest anti-anti-Semite we know. You go around the world telling people that they have to love Israel and the Jewish people. We love you for that. But if you could just put Yeshua aside you could come to our side and then the church tells me look you're obviously crazy about Yeshua you're crazy about Jesus you're the one of the most crazed people I know but if you could just get rid of some of the Jewish stuff then you can come to our side you know so I used to get pulled now you know what I'm doing I don't feel pulled anymore I'm pulling them together I don't feel frustrated anymore because after 25 years I see it happening it's happening guys it's actually happening More and more Jews are coming to Yeshua and being more Jewish than they ever were. And the church is realizing, oh my God, we're grafted into this nation. It's happening. You might not see it. It's like that snowball coming downhill. It's not huge yet, but nobody can stop it. Nobody can stop it. Cat's out of the bag. We know. We know about God's feasts and times. We know nobody can stop it. You can refute it in ignorance, but you can't show where it's not true. Cat's out of the bag, right? Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Okay, he gets it, but Jacob, sadly enough, he's bargaining with God for like less than what God told him. I'll be with you. I'll be your companion. I'll definitely keep you safe. I'll guide you. I'll bring you back. Look what he says in Genesis 28, 20 through 22. Jacob took this vow. If God will be with me, this is what he says after the dream. If God will be with me, you know when you were kind of young and you said, oh God, I know I did this all the time. I was the king of making contracts with God. If you let me sink these two foul shots. <laughs> you know what I mean? When I played sports, if you let me catch this ball in the end zone, I'm telling you, I will, I'll be your man. Did anybody ever do that? <laughs> well, this is kind of what Jacob's doing, guys. He kind of doesn't really know. He doesn't have enough faith. Faith has been, not been developed yet. When you come to the Lord, it's not like you have faith. Faith is cultivated. You think you have faith. No, you're just excited. You're on the honeymoon. Oh, I got saved. Everything's going to be great. That's what you think. <laughs> you, you, now, you now have a, a target on your back. Everything's going to be the opposite of great. So he takes this vow. If God will be with me, okay, God, if you'll be with me and will guard, guard me, which he already told him I'll do, on the road I'm traveling, because he's concerned about Esau, and he's concerned about Haran, he's concerned about a lot of things, which you would be too in the wilderness, so would I. Giving me bread to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return to my father's house in peace, meaning I come back to Bethel, then Adonai will be my God, and this stone which I've set up as a standing stone will be God's house, Bethel, and of everything you give me, I will faithfully return one-tenth to you. By the way, the tithe has been around way before Malachi, 
And it was around, it was around in, in Matthew 23, Yeshua confirmed it, and it's going to be around forever. Okay? People will not do it. They 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 will not do it. And they sit and say, obey the Torah. You're full of it. Okay? You're full of it. Anyway, getting back to the point, okay? He is bargaining for less. His faith just isn't developed yet. He's just not strong enough to take God as word, which, which we don't either. We, right? When we get the horrible news or the walls are caving in, it's very hard to proclaim God's promises. If you do, the word of God is empowering. It starts marinating. Your soul starts marinating, and faith starts developing. It starts like a percolator. When you plug it in, it starts perking. You see that coffee start per- It Faith starts perking, and all of a sudden you're like, all right, I think, yeah. We can do this thing, but you've got to proclaim it. Once you start going, oh, this is going to be bad, you're done. You follow? And it's not easy for any of us, but the alternative stinks. It's like people say, I hate exercise. I hate exercise. Who likes it? You've got to be out of your mind. But what's the alternative? What's the alternative? So his faith is weak. He's not taking God his word. And then he goes off to Haran and you know what happens there, obviously. So we open now in Genesis 35 with God's command. He's been away for 20 years, okay? God's command. He's an old man now. God commands Jacob to fulfill the vow he made 30 years earlier. In Genesis 28, he says, come on home, okay? So now we're at Genesis 35, 1 through 5, and he's on his way back to Bethel, where he got that vision of the ladder. You follow? It's 30 years later. We read it and we go, it's three chapters. Those three chapters are 30 years. God said to Jacob, get up and go up to Bethel. You notice that even though he's coming down, whenever you go to Israel, it's going up. Because it's God's spot. (laughs) So whenever you go, you're going up. Go up to Bethel and live there and make there an altar to God who appeared to you when you fled Esau, your brother. In Genesis 28, 30 years earlier. Then Jacob said to his household and all the others with him, get rid of the foreign gods that you have with you. Purify yourselves and put on fresh clothes. How'd they get foreign gods? These were all heathens. Laban was a heathen. Okay. Rebecca took her father's idols. Also, if you'll read in Genesis 35 with the Shechemites, okay, they took the booty from the Shechemites and some of the women. Of course they had idols. So before he can go to the house of God, he had to purify himself. You hear the message. Before you come in here, you should purify yourself. It doesn't take much. Get rid of the idols. How can you come into the presence of God if you don't? You think you do. You sing all you want. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Listen to me. It doesn't work. You can bind and loose. It doesn't work. It's, it's Yahweh or the highway. It's God's way. He's very emphatic about running things. He's a little bit of a control freak. And he doesn't give up his name or his seat for anyone. He does not share his glory. That's the deal breaker. God is merciful and loving. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He's incredibly kind and he's good and he's available and he's better to us than we could ever be to ourselves. However, he will not share his glory, pal. Don't tell me about how many people you led to the Lord. Tell me about how many people the Lord led to the Lord. They purify themselves. We're going to move and go up to Bethel. There I will build an altar to God who answered me when I was in such distress and stayed with me wherever I went. Okay, he's going to honor God because God's been good to him all this time. He has protected him. He has guided him. And he is bringing him back. Rabbi, it took 30 years. Well, I'm sorry. They didn't live in the society we live in today. Today, everybody wants it yesterday. Because of all our gizmos, we got to have it right away. High speed, high speed. I had to wait two seconds to get to that website. Isn't there something faster out there? I want to take a pill and make everything better. Develop a pill. And you get these idiots that says we have, and you get idiots that buy it. Because everybody wants to take a pill. God, give me a faith pill so I can trust you. It's not going to work like that. He's going to put you in a situation that slams you, and you're going to cry out and beg him. 
You're going to have to have an encounter. You're going to have to know who he is. Your faith is going to have to be real for you. They gave Yaakov all the foreign gods in their possession and the earrings they were wearing, which was two cult gods, and Yaakov buried them under the pistachio tree near Shechem. While they were traveling, a terror from God fell upon the cities around them so that none of them pursued the sons of Jacob. Look, there was warring cities and warring towns that were looking to take him out with his family. He had 11 sons at this point. He had many handmaids and concubines and, and slaves and workers, and he had a huge entourage, and he had a lot of booty from Laban. The money was in the livestock. They wanted to take it all. People were marauders then, they're marauders today. Let's get the money, let's take them, but nobody could touch them. It's very interesting to me, once they were wholehearted towards God, then terror fell on the enemy. You follow? God didn't just go, okay, don't worry about it, I got this. No, no, you're going to have to keep yourself straight. You follow? Told Joshua, everywhere you put your foot, you're going to have victory, as long as you obey my commands. I told my kids, I'll treat you like little princes and princesses, but if you don't do what I say, mm mm-mm. You breached the contract. Mm Mm-mm. Yep. Okay, 9 through 12, we're almost home, almost there. 9 through 12, after Jacob arrived from Padam Aran, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will be called Jacob no longer. Okay? You paid your dues. You put away the gods. You trust me now. You're Israel. You see that I strive. God strives. It's about me. I can do this thing. You trust me now. You get it. You're not Jacob anymore. You're not supplanter anymore. No way. Thus he named him Israel. God further said to him, I am El Shaddai, which means I'm not a promise maker. I'm a promise keeper. I'm God Almighty. I'm Almighty God. I'm a promise keeper. I'm going to keep my promises. Watch what I do. Watch what happens to your little offspring. A nation will come from you. Indeed, a group of nations will come from you. Kings will descend from you from Judah, kings, even the king of all kings. Moreover, the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, Israel, Canaan, I'll give to you. It's yours. It's your possession. And I will give the land to your descendants after you. It's, it's an irrefutable fact, my friend. Why are you being a politician? I thought you're blood bought. Why are you selling out to man? In your intelligence, you're proving to be spiritually and biblically an ignoramus. Return to Bethel. That should be our battle cry. That should be our motto. Return to the house of God. Sometimes we can't return to the house of God because sin is a lifestyle. Okay? You're married, you got a girlfriend, you got a problem. You can't return to the house of God. Throw up your hands, sing songs, it don't matter. That's one. The trap, this tolerance, relative, apathetic, political correctness, does it not get you sick? Well, instead of sitting in a church week in, week out, which is tolerant and relative, go somewhere else. If you can't change them, then get out from her. Because they're going to change you. And all you're going to do is sit there frustrated week in, week out, and you're going to be mad at God. You don't have to be mad at God. Just because you live in a goat nation, you don't have to become a goat. as Daniel in Babylon. You're going to get complacent. This is why I push it. Every week you get complacent. Every week I can get complacent. You think, oh, no, Rabbi, I love the Lord. No. No, you love other things. Things get skewed. Your priorities get off. Your job, your career, money, kids, workouts, skin care, whatever. Those things are important, but but not when they become a God. And sometimes you don't even realize it. And you say, he's talking to somebody else. God is talking to me. He's talking to me, guys. He's saying, your priorities get screwed up. You worry about stupid things when you should be taking care of your kids. You worry about other people when you should be worried about your wife. You're so worried about the ministry that you're not spending intimate time with me. You're screwed up. I love you, but you're screwed up. Let me get you back to Bethel. You think I'm a teacher? I'm not a teacher. I'm a student. So should you be.
It's too easy. We get distracted too. Distracted with stuff that doesn't matter. We get burnt out over a burnt out patch in our yard. And the yard will outlive you. You want me to do your funeral and say, here lies a lady with a really nice yard? <laughs> do I think there's something wrong with taking care of a yard? No. But at the risk of worshiping it, yes. Amen. You want to know that your yard looks good? Come and see mine, and then you'll appreciate yours. <laughs> if you think you don't have enough stuff in your house, come to my house. Stuff is overrated, and it's a burden. Amen. It's an albatross. There is nothing that somebody can't steal from my house that I won't lose no sleep over. Well, not burning than the kids, I'd probably... <laughs> two, three nights, and then, you know, I'd be... <laughs> I'd realize they're gone, and then I'd be like, look, I'm used to it. <laughs> But more importantly, guys, God is confirming this incredible covenant. He's reconfirming this Abrahamic covenant that kings will come no matter what. Do you see how graceful God is? He's saying to Jacob, you had nothing to do with this. Isaac, you couldn't even get your wife pregnant. Abraham, you were 100 years old. Why do you think when he cut the animals, he went through and Abraham did not go through? Whenever you make a covenant, there's two parties and they go through the slain animals it's, it's very fearsome. You go through these animals and they're cut and their guts are hanging, their blood. And what you're saying is, if I break this covenant, this is my comeuppance. Do you follow? That's how strong your word was back in the day. If I break this covenant. But when he made that covenant with Abraham, he, Abraham went to grab his hand. He said, Just sit down. I'm going to do this. It's unconditional. My grace prevails. Do you follow? God's grace is crazy. He was going to bring forth a Messiah at the right time. So I, I go to Israel every year, and I sit with the Jewish people in the court, and they go, we don't need a sacrifice. I'm like, our oh, people, we're given the sacrificial system. Am I taking crazy pills? It says in Numbers 28, we sacrificed on Shabbat. It says in Leviticus 1 through 5, we sacrificed on the feasts. It says in Exodus 28, 29, we had an eternal sacrifice. Every morning and every afternoon we sacrificed. We're the people of sacrifice. We were given this system. How could you say there's no need for a sacrifice? It says in Leviticus 17, 11, there's no remission of sin without blood. There has to be a zobach. There has to be a substitute, an innocent victim to take the hit. What are you telling me? Are you telling me some rabbinical, Talmudic stuff that doesn't coincide with the Torah? I'm not interested in rabbinical writings. I'm interested in the writings of God. Of course we need a sacrifice. And God was sick and tired of goats and bulls because nobody cared anymore. Nobody cared. Let me close with this. Sin has ramifications. And Jacob paid dearly. Make no mistake. He paid for it. His brother sought to murder him, which forced Jacob to flee from his own father's house. His uncle Laban deceived him. He and I worked for him for 20 years. 20 years hard labor. He experienced the baseness of his son Reuben, who slept with his concubine Bilha. His daughter Dina was raped. The treachery of Simeon and Levi's two sons towards the Shechemites he had to deal with. And the loss of his beloved wife Rachel as she died in childbirth. And the supposed untimely end of Joseph. He had to live with that for years. The death of his son. And forced by famine, he had to go to Egypt, and there he died in a strange land. Sounds like a great life? It's not always easy following God. And none of us have it down pat. Please, you know this is a house of humility. Don't act super spiritual with me or here. It's not going to work. It's a struggle. And we all make mistakes. And none of us are perfect. But boy, you got to love a good effort, huh? And I love the way Jacob recovered. And I love the grace of God. With all that he went through, God's love provided what his holiness demanded. With all he went through, and God being holy, and us not being so holy at times, God provided. Leviticus 16 talks about an atonement. I mean, listen to it, it's crazy. You've got the holiest man going in. 
okay? You've got the 12 tribes of Israel, but the holiest tribe was Levi, okay? The servants. Levi in Hebrew means to be joined to God. They were joined to God. They didn't get property because God was their inheritance. And they served the Lord. They cleaned up the blood day in, day out. They cleaned, they cleaned. They were servants and butlers and, and, and cleaning chambermaids, if you will. But then there was the tribe from Aaron who were the priests. They got to burn the incense. Then of all the men, the priests were the holiest. But then there was one, the Kohen Hagadol, the holiest of the holiest, who got to go in one time a year. So the holiest man goes into the holiest spot. Of the whole world, Israel's the holiest spot. Jerusalem, the holiest city. The Temple Mount, the holiest piece of landscape. And then the temple, the holy of holies, is the holiest spot on earth. The holiest man goes in the holiest spot on the holiest day. 365 days, you've got seven feasts. Shabbat is the holiest, Yom Kippur. Where they make atonement. It's called the Shabbat of Shabbats. The holiest man on the holiest day goes into the holiest spot. Why? Because there's no remission of sin without blood. Do you feel this? Do you feel this? And I'm trying to make you feel that his love is real. And it means everything. Through Jacob's dream at Bethel and his wrestling match at Peniel, Bethel, the house of God, he wrestles and sees the face of God. Through this experience, we learn about this intimate fellowship, this relationship we can have if we connect and grab on. Through God's great sacrifice in Yeshua, we can enter the house of God. And one day we'll see God's face. What a blessed hope we have. What a blessed inheritance we have. What a blessed future we have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, I don't know nothing about technology. I can't even put an attachment on an email. Do you believe this? I don't know how to attach something to an email, but I know this, hashtag blessed. <laughs> and I don't know from InstaFace or a Graham book or any of it. I don't know it and I don't want to know it. People all over the world say, you got to have a Facebook page. you got to have a Facebook page. I got my face in his book. Okay, so let's, let's end on a good note. Let's look at Revelation real quick because we read from Revelation. Okay? This is, this is John's apocalyptic revelatory vision. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. New meaning renewed. It's not going to be a new earth. The earth was fine. Before, Reve before Genesis 3. Okay? Waterfalls don't sin. It's going to be fixed. Yeshua is coming to fix and restore what the locust devoured. Then I saw a new heaven renewed, like when you see a new moon. When you see a new moon, it's the same moon that's renewed. It's not, a, it's not a different moon. It's the same moon renewed. It's the same word. Chodesh. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the earth, earth passed away. Thank God. Drop dead, rest in peace. And the sea was no longer there. Also, I saw the holy city. You see? I told you how the ladder connects. The holy city in Jerusalem. It's going to connect physically. Also, I saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The earth will receive her. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, see, see, I told you. God's Shekinah, his glory is with mankind. They're one and he will live with them. It's not about you going, it's he's coming. <laughs> I read Revelation, he's coming. Why do we keep thinking about going and playing a harp on a cloud? Frankly, that doesn't sound like a good time to me. <laughs> they will be his people. And he himself, God with them, Emmanuel, will be their God. Just like it was in the garden. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Rabbi, why do you talk about this so much? What would you like me to talk about? I find this is quite exciting. Thinking about God coming back and restoring our world. 
You know what I mean? Aren't you tired of having ectomies? They can't keep taking stuff, man. It's supposed to be in there. There will no longer be any death and there will no longer be any mourning, crying or pain. There will be no death. There will be no mourning, no crying or pain. There's no more death. There's no more mourning. There's no more crying or pain. That's the old order. It's dead. Let's move on to the new order. Next, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, sparkling like crystal. Perfect, pure, clean, crystal clear, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Between the main street of the river was the tree of life producing 12 kinds of fruit. Doesn't mean people are going to be sick. There won't be any sickness. A different kind every month, and the leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curses. Okay, what that means is they'll just be blessing. Some people say I'm totally blessed. No, you're not. Sorry. Sorry. You had to see a dermatologist? You're not totally blessed. Okay, you've got something. Why are you going? <laughs> the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will no longer exist. Say so they will need neither the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun. Because Adonai, the Lord our God, will shine upon them. And they will reign. See, we don't feel like we're reigning. Some of us maybe because maybe we have important jobs and we're very well sought after. And people give us all these kudos. We're not reigning right now. In the spiritual, prophetically, yes, but we will reign as kings forever and ever. <laughs> Last but not least, how blessed are those who wash their robes? How blessed. You can't be more blessed. When you wear the robe of righteousness, you can't be more blessed. He said he'll give you a garment of praise for the garment of heaviness. It's not an overcoat. You've got to take that garment of heaviness off. How blessed are those who wash their robes so that they have the right, you have the right to eat from the tree of life and go through the gates into the city. No more ladder. It's going to be right there. Right there. You're in. You can go into the gates of the city, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, with God's presence there. The one who is testifying to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Yes, you've been saying this for a long time. Yes, so we're 2,000 years closer. I have taught enough on the sign of the times. I wouldn't even belabor it anymore. It's obviously where we are in a timeline. Amen. Like... Amen, you know? <laughs> I mean, amen. Like, yes, we, 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 the people in this first century wanted Yeshua to come so bad. And the Orthodox Jews were at the wall crying out for Messiah. They'll see him for who he is one day. But they're crying out. Jews that aren't crying out don't even get it. They're crying out, massively crying, Messiah, come. The remnant is saying, Messiah, come. It's the complacent and the ignorant that is saying, doesn't matter. Just as long as when I die, I get to go to heaven and play a harp on a cloud. Amen. Come, Lord Yeshua. May the grace of the Lord Yeshua be with you all. Look, let me give you this CSJB, the complete Southern Jewish Bible. I'm fixing to come back right quick. You all be ready now. You hear? Let's stand up together. Look, Bethel's coming. And I'm not saying we got to be perfect because if we have to be perfect, I can't get in. And neither can you. But I think we might want to do some house cleaning. Amen. It's not between me and you, and it's not between you and me. My house might be filthy. Your house might be a lot cleaner than mine. I don't know. 
it, it's not for me to know. It's not my business. It's kind of my concern because I love you, but because it's not my business, I could just be so concerned. Don't be so concerned about the world. Politics is politics. It's always been. The Roman senators are here, and they're here to stay. Okay? They're not going to take care of us. And if we could ever get together and just say, you know what? Come April 15th, I'm not sending in a tax return. What are you going to do about it? If we got the 20 or 30 million Americans who could ever come together and get off their butts and harmonize, what are they going to do without money? Their listeners supported, no? It's never going to happen. And I'm not telling you to be selfish. I'm telling you to stick together in this place. Join forces. You never know what God can do. He did pretty good with Gideon in 300, didn't he? Railroaded 135,000 Midianites. He did it then. He could do it again. Just stay close to God in these end days. Keep loving them. And even when it's hard, try to stay faithful. I'm with you, okay? I don't have this thing. I'm not telling you. I got it, so I'm telling you, you need to do it. I'm telling you, I don't have it. But I'm going to keep going after it till I do. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Shalom. I love you guys. Shabbat shalom.